Section 19 of The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy LaFaro, New South Wales, Australia. The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1, by Anonymous. Translated by Jonathan Scott. Section 19. The Story of Sinbad the Voyager. In the reign of the same Caliph Harun al-Rashid, whom I have already mentioned, there lived at Baghdad a poor porter called Hinbad. One day, when the weather was excessively hot, he was employed to carry a heavy burden from one end of the town to the other. Being much fatigued, and having still a great way to go, he came into a street where a refreshing breeze blew on his face, and the pavement was sprinkled with rose-water. As he could not desire a better place to rest and recruit himself, he took off his load and sat upon it, near a large mansion. He was much pleased that he stopped in this place, for the agreeable smell of wood of aloes and of pastils that came from the house, mixing with the scent of the rose-water, completely perfumed and embalmed the air. Besides, he heard from within a concert of instrumental music, accompanied with the harmonious notes of nightingales and other birds peculiar to the climate. This charming melody, and the smell of several sorts of savoury dishes, made the porter conclude there was a feast with great rejoicings within. His business seldom leading him that way, he knew not to whom the mansion belonged, but to satisfy his curiosity he went to some of the servants, whom he saw standing at the gate in magnificent apparel, and asked the name of the proprietor. How, replied one of them, do you live in Baghdad, and not know that this is the house of Sinbad the sailor, that famous voyager who has sailed round the world? The porter who had heard of this Sinbad's riches could not but envy a man whose condition he thought to be as happy as his own was deplorable. And his mind being fretted with these reflections, he lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said aloud enough to be heard, Almighty Creator of all things, consider the difference between Sinbad and me. I am every day exposed to fatigues and calamities, and can scarcely get coarse barley bread for myself and my family, whilst happy Sinbad profusely expends immense riches, and leads a life of continual pleasure. What has he done to obtain from thee a lot so agreeable, and what have I done to deserve one so wretched? Having finished his expostulation, he struck his foot against the ground, like a man absorbed in grief and despair. Whilst the porter was thus indulging his melancholy, a servant came out of the house, and taking him by the arm, bade him follow him, for Simbad, his master, wanted to speak to him. Sir, your majesty may easily imagine that the repining Hinbad was not a little surprised at this compliment for, considering what he had said, he was afraid Sinbad had sent for him to punish him. Therefore, he would have excused himself, alleging that he could not leave his burden in the middle of the street. But Sinbad's servants assured him they would look to it, and were so urgent with him that he was obliged to yield. The servants brought him into a great hall, where a number of people sat round a table, covered with all sorts of savoury dishes. At the supper end sat a comely, venerable gentleman, with a long white beard, and behind him stood a number of officers and domestics, all ready to attend his pleasure. This personage was Sinbad. The porter, whose fear was increased at the sight of so many people, and of a banquet so sumptuous, saluted the company trembling. Sinbad bade him draw near, and seating him at his right hand, served him himself, and gave him excellent wine, of which there was abundance upon the sideboard. When the repast was over, 
Sinbad addressed his conversation to Hindbad, and calling him brother, according to the manner of the Arabians, when they are familiar one with another, inquired his name and employment. "'My lord,' answered he, "'my name is Hindbad.' "'I am very glad to see you,' replied Sinbad. "'And I dare say the same on behalf of all the company, "'but I wish to hear from your own mouth "'what it was you lately said in the street.' Sinbad had himself heard the porter complain through the window, and this it was that induced him to have him brought in. At this request, Hinbad hung down his head in confusion, and replied, My lord, I confess that my fatigue put me out of humour, and occasioned me to utter some indiscreet words, which I beg you to pardon. Do not think I am so unjust, resumed Sinbad as to resent such a complaint i consider your condition and instead of upbraiding commiserate you but i must rectify your error concerning myself you think no doubt that i have acquired without labour and trouble the ease and indulgence which i now enjoy but do not mistake i did not attain to this happy condition without enduring for several years more trouble of body and mind than can well be imagined. Yes, gentlemen, he added, speaking to the whole company, I can assure you my troubles were so extraordinary that they were calculated to discourage the most covetous from undertaking such voyages as I did, to acquire riches. Perhaps you have never heard a distinct account of my wonderful adventures, and the dangers I encountered in my seven voyages, and since I have this opportunity, I will give you a faithful account of them, not doubting, but it will be acceptable. As Simbad wished to relate his adventures chiefly on the porter's account, he ordered his burden to be carried to the place of its destination, and then proceeded. End of section 19 Section 20 of The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy LaFaro, New South Wales, Australia The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1 by Anonymous. Translated by Dr. Jonathan Scott. Section 20. I inherited from my father considerable property, the greater part of which I squandered in my youth in dissipation. But I perceived my error, and reflected that riches were perishable, and quickly consumed by such ill managers as myself. I farther considered that by my irregular way of living, I wretchedly misspent my time, which is, of all things, the most valuable. I remembered the saying of the great Solomon, which I had frequently heard from my father, that death is more tolerable than poverty. Struck by these reflections, I collected the remains of my fortune, and sold all my effects by public auction. Then I entered into a contract with some merchants, who traded by sea. I took the advice of such as I thought most capable of assisting me, and resolving to improve what money I had, I went to Busora, and embarked with several merchants, on board a ship which we had jointly fitted out. We set sail, and steered our course towards the Indies, through the Persian Gulf, which is formed by the coasts of Arabia Felix, on the right, and those of Persia on the left, and, according to common opinion, is seventy leagues wide at the broadest place. The eastern sea, as well as that of the Indies, is very spacious. It is bounded on one side by the coast of Abyssinia, and is four thousand five hundred leagues in length of the isles of Vakvak. At first I was troubled with the sea-sickness, 
but speedily recovered my health, and was not afterwards subject to that complaint. In our voyage we touched at several islands, where we sold or exchanged our goods. One day, whilst under sail, we were becalmed near a small island, but little elevated above the level of the water, and resembling a green meadow. The captain ordered his sails to be furled, and permitted such persons as were so inclined to land. Of this number I was one. But while we were enjoying ourselves in eating and drinking, and recovering ourselves from the fatigue of the sea, the island of a sudden trembled, and shook us terribly. The trembling of the island was perceived on board the ship, and we were called upon to re-embark speedily, or we should all be lost, for what we took for an island proved to be the back of a sea-monster. The nimblest got into the sloop, others betook themselves to swimming, but for myself I was still upon the back of the creature when he dived into the sea, and I had time only to catch hold of a piece of wood that we had brought out of the ship to make fire. Meanwhile the captain, having received those on board who were in the sloop, and taken up some of those that swam, resolved to improve the favourable gale that had just risen, and hoisting his sails, pursued his voyage, so that it was impossible for me to recover the ship. Thus I was exposed to the mercy of the waves. I struggled for my life all the rest of the day, and the following night. By this time I found my strength gone, and despaired of saving my life, when happily a wave threw me against an island. The bank was high and rugged, so that I could scarcely have got up, had it not been for some roots of trees, which fortune seemed to have preserved in this place for my safety. Having reached the land, I lay down upon the ground half dead, until the sun appeared. Then, though I was very feeble, both from hard labour and want of food, I crept along to find some herbs fit to eat, and had the good luck not only to procure some, but likewise to discover a spring of excellent water, which contributed much to recover me. After this I advanced farther into the island, and at last reached a fine plain, where at a great distance I perceived a horse feeding. I went towards it, fluctuating between hope and fear, for I knew not whether in advancing I was more likely to endanger or preserve my life. As I approached, I perceived it to be a very fine mare, tied to a stake. Whilst I was admiring its beauty, I heard from beneath the voice of a man, who immediately appeared, and asked me who I was. I related to him my adventure, after which, taking me by the hand, he led me into a cave, where there were several other people, no less amazed to see me than I was to see them. I partook of some provisions which they offered me. I then asked them what they did in such a desert place, to which they answered, that they were grooms belonging to Maharaja, sovereign of the island that every year, at the same season, they brought thither the king's mares, and fastened them as I had seen, until they were covered by a sea-horse, who afterwards endeavoured to destroy the mares, but was prevented by their noise, and obliged to return to the sea. The mares, when in foal, were taken back, and the horses thus produced were kept for the king's use, and called sea-horses. They added that they were to return home on the to-morrow, and had I been one day later, I must have perished, because the inhabited part of the island was a great distance, and it would have been impossible for me to have got thither without a guide. While they entertained me thus, the horse came out of the sea, as they had told me, covered the mare, and afterwards would have devoured her, but upon a great noise made by the grooms, he left her, and plunged into the sea. Next morning they returned with their mares to the capital of the island, took me with them, and presented me to the Maharaja. 
he asked me who I was, and by what adventure I had come into his dominions. After I had satisfied him, he told me he was much concerned for my misfortune, and at the same time ordered that I should want nothing, which commands his officers were so generous and careful as to see exactly fulfilled. Being a merchant, I frequented men of my own profession, and particularly inquired for those who were strangers, that perchance I might hear news from Baghdad, or find an opportunity to return. For the Maharaja's capital is situated on the sea coast, and has a fine harbour, where ships arrive daily from the different quarters of the world. I frequented also the society of the learned Indians, and took delight to hear them converse, but withal I took care to make my court regularly to the Maharaja, and conversed with the governors and petty kings, his tributaries that were about him. They put a thousand questions respecting my country, and I, being willing to inform myself as to their laws and customs, asked them concerning everything which I thought worth knowing. There belongs to this king an island named Cassel. They assured me that every night a noise of drums was heard there, whence the mariners fancied that it was the residence of Degil. I determined to visit this wonderful place, and in my way thither saw fishes of hundred and two hundred cubits long. That occasion more fear than hurt for they are so timorous that they will fly upon the rattling of two sticks or boards. I saw likewise other fish about a cubit in length, that had heads like owls. As I was one day at the port after my return, a ship arrived, and as soon as she cast anchor, they began to unload her, and the merchants on board ordered their goods to be carried into the custom-house. As I cast my eye upon some labels, and looked to the name, I found my own, and perceived the bales to be the same that I had embarked at Busora. I also knew the captain, but being persuaded that he believed me to be drowned, I went and asked him whose bales these were. He replied that they belonged to a merchant at Baghdad called Sinbad, who came to sea with him, but one day, being near an island, as was supposed, he went ashore with several other passengers upon this island, which was only a monstrous fish that lay asleep upon the surface of the water. But as soon as he felt the heat of the fire they had kindled upon his back to dress some victuals, began to move, and dived under water. Most of the persons who were upon him perished, and among them the unfortunate Simbad, whose bales belonged to him, and I am resolved to trade with them until I meet with some of his family, to whom I may return the profit. I am that Simbad, said I, whom you thought to be dead, and those bales are mine. When the captain heard me speak thus, Heavens! he exclaimed, who can we trust in these times? There is no faith left among men. I saw Sinbad perish with my own eyes, as did also the passengers on board, and yet you tell me that you are that Sinbad? What impudence is this? To look on you, one would take you to be a man of probity, and yet you tell a horrible falsehood in order to possess yourself of what does not belong to you. Have patience, replied I. Do me the favour to hear what I have to say. Very well, said he. Speak. I am ready to hear you. Then I told him how I had escaped, and by what adventure I met with the grooms of Maharaja, who had brought me to his court. His confidence began to abate upon this declaration, and he was at length persuaded that I was no cheat. For there came people from his ship who knew me, paid me great compliments, and expressed much joy at seeing me alive. At last he recollected me himself, and embracing me, Heaven be praised, said he, 
for your happy escape. I cannot express the joy it affords me. There are your goods. Take and do with them. As you please. I thanked him, acknowledged his probity, and in requital offered him part of my goods as a present, which he generously refused. I took out what was most valuable in my bales, and presented them to the Maharaja, who, knowing my misfortune, asked me how I came by such rarities. I acquainted him with the circumstances of their recovery. He was pleased at my good luck, accepted my present, and in return gave me one much more considerable. Upon this I took leave of him, and went aboard the same ship, after I had exchanged my goods for the commodities of that country. I carried with me wood of aloes, sandal, camphor, nutmegs, cloves, pepper, and ginger. We passed by several islands, and at last arrived at Busora, from whence I came to this city, with the value of one hundred thousand sequins. My family and I received one another with all the transports of sincere affection. I bought slaves of both sexes, and a landed estate, and built a magnificent house. Thus I settled myself, resolving to forget the miseries I had suffered, and to enjoy the pleasures of life. Sinbad stopped here, and ordered the musicians to proceed with their concert, which the story had interrupted. The company continued enjoying themselves till evening, and it was time to retire. When Sinbad sent for a purse of one hundred sequins, and giving it to the porter said, Take this, Hindbad, return to your home, and come back to-morrow to hear more of my adventures. The porter went away, astonished at the honour done, and the present made him. The account of his adventure proved very agreeable to his wife and children, who did not fail to return thanks to God, for what providence had sent him by the hand of Sinbad. Hindbad put on his best apparel next day, and returned to the bountiful traveller, who received him with a pleasant air and welcomed him heartily. When all the guests had arrived, dinner was served, and continued a long time. When it was ended, Sinbad, addressing himself to the company, said, "'Gentlemen, be pleased to listen to the adventures of my second voyage. They deserve your attention even more than those of the first. Upon which every one held his peace, and Sinbad proceeded. End of section 20「Section 21 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy LaFaro, New South Wales, Australia. The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1, by Anonymous. Translated by Dr. Jonathan Scott. Section 21 I designed after my first voyage to spend the rest of my days at Baghdad, as I had the honour to tell you yesterday, but it was not long ere I grew weary of an indolent life. My inclination to trade revived. I bought goods proper for the commerce I intended and put to sea a second time with merchants of known probity. We embarked on board a good ship, and after recommending ourselves to God, we set sail. We traded from island to island, and exchanged commodities with great profit. One day we landed in an island covered with several sorts of fruit trees, but we could see neither man nor animal. We went to take a little fresh air in the meadows, along the streams that watered them. While some diverted themselves with gathering flowers and other fruits, I took my wine and provisions, and sat down near a stream betwixt two high trees, which formed a thick shade. I made a good meal, and afterwards fell asleep. 
I cannot tell how long I slept. But when I awoke, the ship was gone. I was much alarmed at finding the ship gone. I got up and looked around me, but could not see one of the merchants who landed with me. I perceived the ship under sail, but at such a distance that I lost sight of her in a short time. I leave you to guess at my melancholy reflections in this sad condition. I was ready to die with grief. I cried out in agony, beat my head and breast, and threw myself upon the ground, where I lay some time in despair. One afflicting thought being succeeded by another still more afflicting. I upbraided myself a hundred times for not being content with the produce of my first voyage. That might have sufficed me all my life. But all this was in vain, and my repentance too late. At last I resigned myself to the will of God. Not knowing what to do, I climbed up to the top of a lofty tree, from whence I looked about on all sides, to see if I could discover anything that could give me hopes. When I gazed towards the sea, I could see nothing but sky and water. But looking over the land, I beheld something white and coming down. I took what provision I had left and went towards it, the distance being so great that I could not distinguish what it was. As I approached, I thought it to be a white dome, of a prodigious height and extent. And when I came up to it, I touched it, and found it to be very smooth. I went round to see if it was open on any side, but saw it was not, and that there was no climbing up to the top as it was so smooth. It was at least fifty paces round. By this time the sun was about to set, and all of a sudden the sky became as dark as if it had been covered with a thick cloud. I was much astonished at this sudden darkness, but much more when I found it occasioned by a bird of a monstrous size that came flying toward me. I remembered that I had often heard mariners speak of a miraculous bird called Rock, and conceived that the great dome which I so much admired must be its egg. In short, the bird alighted and sat over the egg. As I perceived her coming, I crept to the egg so that I had before me one of the legs of the bird, which was as big as the trunk of a tree. I tied myself strongly to it with my turban, in hopes that the rock next morning would carry me with her out of this desert island. After having passed the night in this condition, the bird flew away as soon as it was daylight, and carried me so high that I could not discern the earth. She afterwards descended with so much rapidity that I lost my senses. But when I found myself on the ground, I speedily untied the knot, and had scarcely done so, when the rock, having taken up a serpent of a monstrous length in her bill, flew away. The spot where it left me was encompassed on all sides by mountains, that seemed to reach above the clouds, and so steep that there was no possibility of getting out of the valley. This was a new perplexity, so that when I compared this place with the desert island from which the rock had brought me, I found that I had gained nothing by the change. As I walked through this valley, I perceived it was strewed with diamonds, some of which were of a surprising bigness. I took pleasure in looking upon them, but shortly saw at a distance such objects as greatly diminished my satisfaction, and which I could not view without terror, namely, a great number of serpents, so monstrous that the least of them was capable of swallowing an elephant. They retired in the daytime to their dens, where they hid themselves from the rock their enemy, and came out only in the night. I spent the day in walking about in the valley, resting myself at times in such places as I thought most convenient. When night came on, I went into a cave, where I thought I might repose in safety. 
I secured the entrance, which was low and narrow, with a great stone to preserve me from the serpents, but not so far as to exclude the light. I supped on part of my provisions, but the serpents, which began hissing around me, put me into such extreme fear that you may easily imagine I did not sleep. When day appeared, the serpents retired, and I came out of the cave trembling. I can justly say that I walked upon diamonds, without feeling any inclination to touch them. At last I sat down, and notwithstanding my apprehensions, not having closed my eyes during the night, fell asleep, after having eaten a little more of my provision. But I had scarcely shut my eyes, when something that fell by me with a great noise awakened me. This was a large piece of raw meat, and at the same time I saw several others fall down from the rocks in different places. I had always regarded as fabulous what I had heard sailors and others relate of the Valley of Diamonds, and of the stratagems employed by merchants to obtain jewels from thence, but now I found that they had stated nothing but truth, for the fact is that the merchants come to the neighbourhood of this valley, when the eagles have young ones, and throwing great joints of meat into the valley, the diamonds upon whose points they fall, stick to them. The eagles, which are stronger in this country than anywhere else, pounce with great force upon those pieces of meat, and carry them to their nests on the precipices of the rocks to feed their young. The merchants at this time run to their nests, disturb and drive off the eagles by their shouts, and take away the diamonds that stick to the meat. Until I perceived the device I had concluded, it to be impossible for me to get from this abyss, which I regarded as my grave. But now I changed my opinion, and began to think upon the means of my deliverance. I began to collect together the largest diamonds I could find, and put them into a leather bag in which I used to carry my provisions. I afterwards took the largest of the pieces of meat, tied it close around me with the cloth of my turban, and then laid myself upon the ground with my face downward, the bag of diamonds being made fast to my girdle. I had scarcely placed myself in this posture when the eagles came. Each of them seized a piece of meat, and one of the strongest having taken me up with the piece of meat to which I was fastened, carried me to his nest on top of the mountain. The merchants immediately began their shouting to frighten the eagles, and when they had obliged them to quit their prey, one of them came to the nest where I was. He was much alarmed when he saw me, but recovering himself, instead of inquiring how I came hither, began to quarrel with me, and asked why I stole his goods. "'You will treat me,' replied I, "'with more civility, when you know me better. Do not be uneasy. I have diamonds enough for you and myself, more than all the other merchants together.' Whatever they have, they owe to chance, but I selected for myself in the bottom of the valley those which you see in this bag. I had scarcely done speaking when the other merchants came crowding about us, much astonished to see me, but they were much more surprised when I told them my story. Yet they did not so much admire my stratagem to effect my deliverance as to my courage in putting it into execution. They conducted me to their encampment, and there, having opened my bag, they were surprised at the largeness of my diamonds, and confessed that in all the courts which they had visited, they had never seen any of such size and perfection. I prayed the merchant who owned the nest to which I had been carried, for every merchant had his own, to take as many for his share as he pleased. He contented himself with one and that too the least of them. And when I pressed him to take more, without fear of doing me any injury, No, said he, I am very well satisfied with this, which is valuable enough to save me the trouble of making any more voyages, and will raise as great a fortune as I desire. 
I spent the night with the merchants, to whom I related my story a second time, for the satisfaction of those who had not heard it. I could not moderate my joy when I found myself delivered from the danger I have mentioned. I thought myself in a dream, and could scarcely believe myself out of danger. The merchants had thrown their pieces of meat into the valley for several days, and each of them, being satisfied with the diamonds that had fallen to his lot, we left the place the next morning, and travelled near high mountains, where there were serpents of a prodigious length which we had the good fortune to escape. We took shipping at the first port we reached, and touched at the isle of Roja, where the trees grow that yield camphor. This tree is so large, and its branches so thick, that one hundred men may easily sit under its shade. The juice of which the camphor is made exudes from the hole bored in the upper part of the tree, is received in a vessel, where it thickens to a consistency, and becomes what we call camphor. After the juice is thus drawn out, the tree withers and dies. In this island is also found the rhinoceros, an animal less than the elephant, but larger than the buffalo. It has a horn upon its nose, about a cubit in length. This horn is solid, and cleft through the middle. Upon this may be seen white lines, representing the figure of a man. The rhinoceros fights with the elephant, runs his horn into his belly, and carries him off upon his head. But the blood and the fat of the elephant running into his eyes, and making him blind. He falls to the ground, and then, strange to relate, the rock comes and carries them both away in her claws, for food for her young ones. I pass over many other things peculiar to this island, lest I should be troublesome to you. Here I exchanged some of my diamonds for merchandise. From hence we went to other islands, and at last, having touched at several trading towns of the continent, we landed at Bussorah from whence I proceeded to Baghdad. There I immediately gave large presents to the poor, and lived honourably upon the vast riches I had brought, and gained with so much fatigue. Thus Simbad ended the relation of the second voyage, gave Hindbad another hundred sequins, and invited him to come the next day to hear the account of the third. The rest of the guests returned to their homes, and came again the following day at the same hour. And one may be sure the porter did not fail, having by this time almost forgotten his former poverty. When dinner was over, Simbad demanded attention, and gave them an account of his third voyage as follows. End of section 21《セクション22 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Lafaro, New South Wales, Australia.《The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1, by Anonymous。Translated by Dr. Jonathan Scott. Section 22 I soon lost in the pleasures of life the remembrance of the perils I had encountered in my two former voyages, and being in the flower of my age, I grew weary of living without business, and hardening myself against the thought of any danger I might incur, went from Baghdad to Bussorah with the richest commodities of the country. There I embarked again with some merchants. We made a long voyage and touched at several ports, where we carried on a considerable trade. One day, being out in the main ocean, we were overtaken by a dreadful tempest, which drove us from our course. The tempest continued several days, and brought us before the port of an island, which the captain was very unwilling to enter, but we were obliged to cast anchor. 
When we had furled our sails, the captain told us that this, and some other neighbouring islands, were inhabited by hairy savages, who would speedily attack us, and though they were but dwarfs, yet our misfortune was such that we must make no resistance, for they were more in number than the locusts, and if we happened to kill one of them, they would all fall upon us and destroy us. This account of the captain, continued Simbad, put the whole company into great consternation, and we soon found that what he had told us was but too true. An innumerable multitude of frightful savages, about two feet high, covered all over with red hair, came swimming towards us, and encompassed our ship. They spoke to us as they came near, but we understood not their language. They climbed up the sides of the ship with such agility as surprised us. We beheld all this with dread, but without daring to defend ourselves or to divert them from their mischievous design. In short, they took down our sails, cut the cable, and, hauling to the shore, made us all get out, and afterwards carried the ship into another island from whence they had come. All voyagers carefully avoided the island where they left us, it being very dangerous to stay there, for a reason you shall presently hear, but we were forced to bear our affliction with patience. We went forward into the island, where we gathered some fruits and herbs to prolong our lives as long as we could, but we expected nothing but death. As we advanced, we perceived at a distance a vast pile of building, and made towards it. We found it to be a palace, elegantly built and very lofty, with a gate of ebony of two leaves, which we forced open. We entered the court, where we saw before us a large apartment, with a porch, having on one side a heap of human bones, and on the other a vast number of roasting spits. We trembled at this spectacle, and being fatigued with travelling, fell to the ground, seized with deadly apprehension, and lay a long time motionless. The sun set, and whilst we were in the lamentable condition I have described, the gate of the apartment opened with a loud crash, and there came out the horrible figure of a black man, as tall as a lofty palm tree. He had but one eye, and that in the middle of his forehead, where it looked as red as a burning coal. His four teeth were very long and sharp, and stood out of his mouth, which was as deep as that of a horse. His upper lip hung down upon his breast. His ears resembled those of an elephant, and covered his shoulders, and his nails were as long and crooked as the talons of great birds. At the sight of so frightful a giant, we became insensible, and lay like dead men. At last we came to ourselves, and saw him sitting in the porch, looking at us. When he had considered us well, he advanced towards us, and laying his hand upon me, took me up by the nape of my neck, and turned round as a butcher would do a sheep's head. After having examined me, and perceiving me to be so lean that I had nothing but skin and bone, he let me go. He took up all the rest one by one, and viewed them in the same manner. The captain, being the fattest, he held him with one hand, as I would do a sparrow, and thrust the spit through him. Then he kindled a great fire, roasted, and ate him in his apartment for his supper. Having finished his repast, he returned to his porch, where he lay and fell asleep, snoring louder than thunder. He slept thus till morning. As to ourselves, it was not possible for us to enjoy any rest, so that we passed the night in the most painful apprehension that can be imagined. When day appeared, the giant awoke, got up, went out, and left us in the palace. When we thought him at a distance, we broke the melancholy silence we had preserved the whole of the night, and filled the palace with our lamentations and groans. Though we were several in number, and had but one enemy, 
it never occurred to us to effect our deliverance by putting him to death. This enterprise, however, though difficult of execution, was the only design we ought naturally to have formed. We thought of several other expedients, but determined upon none, and submitting ourselves to what it should please God to order concerning us, we spent the day in traversing the island, supporting ourselves with fruits and herbs as we had done the day before. In the evening we sought for some place of shelter, but found none so that we were forced, whether we would or not, to return to the palace. The giant failed not to return, and supped once more upon one of our companions, after which he slept, and snored till day, and then went out and left us as before. Our situation appeared to us so dreadful, that several of my comrades designed to throw themselves into the sea, rather than die so painful a death, and endeavoured to persuade the others to follow their example upon which one of the company answered that we were forbidden to destroy ourselves, but even if that were not the case, it was much more reasonable to devise some method to rid ourselves of the monster who had destined us to so horrible a fate. Having thought of a project for this purpose, I communicated it to my comrades, who approved it. Brethren, said I, you know there is much timber floating upon the coast, if you will be advised by me, let us make several rafts capable of bearing us, and, when they are done, leave them there till we find it convenient to use them. In the meantime, we will carry into execution the design I propose to you for our deliverance from the giant, and if it succeeded, we may remain here patiently awaiting the arrival of some ship to carry us out of this fatal island. But if it happened to miscarry, we will take to our rafts and put to sea." I admit that by exposing ourselves to the fury of the waves we run a risk of losing our lives, but is it not better to be buried in the sea than in the entrails of this monster, who has already devoured two of our number? My advice was approved, and we made rafts capable of carrying three persons on each. We returned to the palace towards the evening, and the giant arrived shortly after. We were forced to submit to seeing another of our comrades roasted, but at last we revenged ourselves on the brutish giant in the following manner. After he had finished his cursed supper, he lay down on his back and fell asleep. As soon as we heard him snore, according to his custom, nine of the boldest among us and myself took each of us a spit, and putting the points of them into the fire till they were burning hot, we thrust them into his eye all at once, and blinded him. The pain made him break out into a frightful yell. He started up and stretched out his hands in order to sacrifice some of us to his rage. But we ran to such places as he could not reach, and after having sought for us in vain, he groped for the gate and went out, howling in agony. We quitted the palace after the giant, and came to the shore where we had left our rafts, and put them immediately to sea. We waited till day in order to get upon them, in case the giant should come towards us with any guide of his own species. But we hoped if he did not appear by sun-rising, and gave over his howling, which we still heard, that he would prove to be dead, and if that happened to be the case, we resolved to stay in that island, and not to risk our lives upon the rafts. But day had scarcely appeared when we perceived our cruel enemy, accompanied with two others almost of the same size, leading him, and a great number more coming before him at a quick pace. We did not hesitate to take to our rafts, and put to sea, with all the speed we could. The giants, who perceived this, took up great stones, and running to the shore, entered the water up to the middle, and threw so exactly that they sunk all the rafts but that I was upon, and all my companions, except the two with me, were drowned. We rowed with all our might, and got out of the reach of the giants. But when we got out to sea, we were exposed to the mercy of the waves and winds, and tossed about, sometimes on one side and sometimes on another, and spent that night and the following day under the most painful uncertainty as to our fate. But the next morning we had the good fortune to be thrown upon an island, where we landed with much joy. We found excellent fruit, 
which afforded us great relief, and recruited our strength. At night we went to sleep on the seashore, but we were awakened by the noise of a serpent of surprising length and thickness, whose scales made a rustling noise as he wound himself along. It swallowed up one of my comrades, notwithstanding his loud cries and the efforts he made to extricate himself from it. Dashing him several times against the ground, it crushed him, and we could hear it gnaw and tear the poor wretch's bones, though we had fled to a considerable distance. The following day, to our great terror, we saw the serpent again, when I exclaimed, Oh, heaven, to what dangers are we exposed? We rejoiced yesterday at having escaped from the cruelty of a giant and the rage of the waves. Now we are fallen into another danger equally dreadful. As we walked about, we saw a large tall tree upon which we designed to pass the following night, for our security, and having satisfied our hunger with fruit, we mounted it accordingly. Shortly after, the serpent came hissing to the foot of the tree, raised himself up against the trunk of it, and meeting with my comrade, who sat lower than I, swallowed him at once, and went off. I remained upon the tree till it was day, and then came down, more like a dead man than one alive, expecting the same fate with my two companions. This filled me with horror, as I advanced some steps to throw myself into the sea. But the natural love of life, prompting us to prolong it as long as we can, I withstood this dictate of despair, and submitted myself to the will of God, who disposes of our lives at his pleasure. In the meantime, I collected together a great quantity of small wood, brambles, and dry thorns, and, making them up into faggots, made a wide circle with them round the tree, and also tied some of them to the branches over my head. Having done this, when the evening came, I shut myself up within this circle, with the melancholy satisfaction that I had neglected nothing which could preserve me from the cruel destiny with which I was threatened. The serpent failed not to come at the usual hour, and went round the tree, seeking for an opportunity to devour me, but was prevented by the rampart I had made, so that he lay till day like a cat watching in vain for a mouse that had fortunately reached a place of safety. When day appeared he retired, but I dared not to leave my fort until the sun arose. I felt so much fatigued by the labour to which it had put me, and suffered so much from his poisonous breath, that death seemed more eligible to me than the horrors of such a state. I came down from the tree, and not thinking of the resignation I had the preceding day resolved to exercise, I ran towards the sea with the design to throw myself into it. God took compassion on my hopeless state, for just as I was going to throw myself into the sea, I perceived a ship at a considerable distance. I called as loud as I could, and taking the linen from my turban, displayed it, that they might observe me. This had the desired effect. The crew perceived me, and the captain sent his boat for me. As soon as I came on board, the merchants and seamen flocked about me to know how I came into that desert island, and after I had related to them all that had befallen me, the oldest among them said to me they had several times heard of the giants that dwelt in that island, that they were cannibals, and ate men raw as well as roasted, and as to the serpents, they added, that there were abundance in the island that hid themselves by day, and came abroad by night. After having testified their joy at my escaping so many dangers, they brought me the best of their provisions, and the captain, seeing that I was in rags, was so generous as to give me one of his own suits. We continued at sea for some time, touched at several islands, and at last landed at that of Salabat, where sandalwood is obtained, which is of great use in medicine. We entered the port and came to anchor. The merchants began to unload their goods in order to sell or exchange them. In the meantime, the captain came to me and said, Brother, I have here some goods that belong to a merchant, who sailed some time on board this ship, and, he being dead, 
I design to dispose of them for the benefit of his heirs when I find who they are. The bales he spoke of lay on the deck, and shewing them to me, he said, There are the goods. I hope you will take care to sell them, and you shall have factorage. I thanked him for thus affording me an opportunity of employing myself, because I hated to be idle. The clerk of the ship took an account of all the bales, with the names of the merchants to whom they belonged, and when he asked the captain in whose name he should enter those he had given me the charge of, "'Enter them,' said the captain, "'in the name of Simbad.' I could not hear myself named without some emotion, and looking steadfastly on the captain, I knew him to be the person who, in my second voyage, had left me in the island where I fell asleep and sailed without me, or sending to sea for me. But I could not recollect him at first. He was so much altered since I had seen him. I was not surprised that he, believing me to be dead, did not recognize me. Captain, said I, was the merchant's name to whom those bales belonged Sinbad? Yes, replied he. That was his name. He came from Baghdad, and embarked on board my ship at Busora. One day, when we landed at an island to take in water and other refreshments, I knew not by what mistake I sailed without observing that he did not re-embark with us. Neither I nor the merchants perceived it till four hours after. We had the wind in our stern, and so fresh a gale that it was not then possible for us to tack about for him. "'You believe him, then, to be dead?' said I. "'Certainly,' answered he. "'No, Captain,' I resumed. "'Look at me, and you may know that I am Sinbad, whom you left in that desert island.' "'The Captain,' continued Sinbad, having considered me attentively, recognized me. "'God be praised,' said he, embracing me. "'I rejoice that fortune has rectified my fault. "'There are your goods, which I always took care to preserve.' I took them from him, and made him the acknowledgments to which he was entitled. From the Isle of Salabat we went to another, where I furnished myself with cloves, cinnamon, and other spices. As we sailed from this island, we saw a tortoise twenty cubits in length and breadth. We observed also an amphibious animal like a cow, which gave milk, its skin is so hard that they usually make bucklers of it. I saw another which had the shape and colour of a camel. In short, after a long voyage, I arrived at Busora, and from thence returned to Baghdad, with so much wealth that I knew not its extent. I gave a great deal to the poor, and bought another considerable estate in addition to what I had already. Thus, Sinbad finished the history of his third voyage, gave another hundred sequins to Hinbad, invited him to dinner again the next day, to hear the story of his fourth voyage. Hinbad and the company retired, and on the following day, when they returned, Sinbad, after dinner, continued the relation of his adventures. End of section 22「Section 23 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy LaFaro, New South Wales, Australia. The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1, by Anonymous. Translated by Dr. Jonathan Scott Section 23 The pleasures and amusements which I enjoyed after my third voyage had not charms sufficient to divert me from another. My passion for trade and my love of novelty again prevailed. I therefore settled my affairs, and having provided a stock of goods fit for the traffic I designed to engage in, I set out on my journey. I took the route to Persia, travelled over several provinces, and then arrived at a port, where I embarked. 
We hoisted our sails and touched at several ports of the continent and some of the eastern islands and put out to sea. We were overtaken by such a sudden gust of wind as obliged the captain to lower his yards and take all other necessary precautions to prevent the danger that threatened us. But all was in vain. Our endeavours had no effect. The sails were split in a thousand pieces, and the ship was stranded. Several of the merchants and seamen were drowned, and the cargo was lost. I had the good fortune with several of the merchants and mariners to get upon some planks, and we were carried by the current to an island which lay before us. There were found fruit and spring water which preserved our lives. We stayed all night near the place where we had been cast ashore, without consulting what we should do. Our misfortune had so much dispirited us that we could not deliberate. Next morning, as soon as the sun was up, we walked from the shore, and advancing into the island, saw some houses which we approached. As soon as we drew near, we were encompassed by a great number of negroes, who seized us, shared us among them, and carried us to their respective habitations. I and five of my comrades were carried to one place. Here they made us sit down, and gave us a certain herb, which they made signs to us to eat. The comrades, not taking notice that the blacks ate none of it themselves, thought only of satisfying their hunger, and ate with greediness. But I, suspecting some trick, would not so much as taste it, which happened well for me, for in little time after I perceived my companions had lost their senses, and that when they spoke to me they knew not what they said. The negroes fed us afterwards with rice, prepared with oil of cocoa nuts, and my comrades, who had lost their reason, ate of it greedily. I also partook of it, but very sparingly. They gave us that herb at first on purpose to deprive us of our senses, that we might not be aware of the sad destiny prepared for us, and they supplied us with rice to fatten us, for being cannibals their design was to eat us as soon as we grew fat. This accordingly happened, for they devoured my comrades, who were not sensible of their condition. But my senses being entire, you may easily guess that instead of growing fat as the rest did, I grew leaner every day. The fear of death, under which I laboured, turned all my food into poison. I fell into a languishing distemper, which proved my safety, for the negroes, having killed and eaten my companions, seeing me to be withered, lean, and sick, deferred my death. Meanwhile I had much liberty, so that scarcely any notice was taken of what I did, and this gave me an opportunity one day to get at a distance from the house, and to make my escape. An old man who saw me, and suspected my design, called to me as loud as he could to return, but instead of obeying him, I redoubled my speed, and quickly got out of sight. At that time there was none but the old man about the houses, the rest being abroad, and not to return till night, which was usual with them. Therefore, being sure that they could not arrive time enough to pursue me, I went on till night. When I stopped to rest a little, and to eat some of the provisions I had secured. But I speedily set forward again, and travelled seven days, avoiding those places which seemed to be inhabited, and lived for the most part upon cocoa-nuts, which served me both for meat and drink. On the eighth day I came near the sea, and saw some white people like myself gathering pepper, of which there was great plenty in that place. This I took to be a good omen, and went to them without any scruple. The people who gathered pepper came to meet me as soon as they saw me, and asked me in Arabic who I was, and whence I came. I was overjoyed to hear them speak in my own language, and satisfied their curiosity by giving them an account of my shipwreck, and how I fell into the hands of the negroes. Those negroes, replied they, eat men, and by what miracle did you escape their cruelty? I related to them the circumstances I have just mentioned, at which they were wonderfully surprised. I stayed with them till they had gathered their quantity of pepper, and then sailed with them to the island from whence they had come. 
they presented me to their king, who was a good prince. He had the patience to hear my relation of my adventures, which surprised him, and he afterwards gave me clothes, and commanded care to be taken of me. The island was very well peopled, plentiful in everything, and the capital a place of great trade. This agreeable retreat was very comfortable to me after my misfortunes, and the kindness of this generous prince completed my satisfaction. In a word, there was not a person more in favour with him than myself, and consequently every man in court and city sought to oblige me, so that in a very little time I was looked upon rather as a native than a stranger. I observed one thing, which to me appeared very extraordinary. All the people, the king himself not excepted, rode their horses without saddle, bridle, or stirrups. This made me one day take the liberty to ask the king how it came to pass. His majesty answered that I talked to him of things which nobody knew the use of in his dominions. I went immediately to a workman and gave him a model for making the stock of a saddle. When that was done, I covered it myself with velvet and leather and embroidered it with gold. I afterwards went to a smith, who made me a bit according to the pattern I shewed him, and also some stirrups. When I had all things completed, I presented them to the king, and put them upon one of his horses. His majesty mounted immediately, and was so pleased with them, that he testified his satisfaction by large presents. I could not avoid making several others for the ministers and principal officers of his household who all of them made me presents that enriched me in a little time. I also made some for the people of best quality in the city, which gained me great reputation and regard. As I paid my court very constantly to the king, he said to me one day, Sinbad, I love thee, and all my subjects who know thee treat thee according to my example. I have one thing to demand of thee, which thou must grant. Sir, answered I, there is nothing but I will do as a mark of my obedience to your majesty, whose power over me is absolute. I have a mind thou shouldst marry, replied he, that so thou mayst stay in my dominions, and think no more of thy own country. I durst not resist the prince's will, and he gave me one of the ladies of his court, noble, beautiful, and rich. The ceremonies of marriage being over, I went and dwelt with my wife, and for some time we lived together in perfect harmony. I was not, however, satisfied with my banishment, therefore designed to make my escape the first opportunity, and to return to Baghdad, which my present settlement, how advantageous soever, could not make me forget. At this time, the wife of one of my neighbours, with whom I had contrasted a very strict friendship, fell sick and died. I went to see and comfort him in his affliction, and finding him absorbed in sorrow, I said to him as soon as I saw him, God preserve you and grant you a long life. Alas, replied he, how do you think I should obtain the favour you wish me? I have not above an hour to live. Pray, said I, do not entertain such a melancholy thought. I hope I shall enjoy your company many years. I wish you, he replied, a long life. But my days are at an end, for I must be buried this day with my wife. This is a law which our ancestors established in this island, and it is always observed inviolably. The living husband is interred with the dead wife, and the living wife with the dead husband. Nothing can save me. Every one must submit to this law. While he was giving me an account of this barbarous custom, the very relation of which chilled my blood, his kindred, friends, and neighbours came in a body to assist at the funeral. They dressed the corpse of the woman in her richest apparel, and all her jewels, as if it had been her wedding day. Then they placed her on an open coffin, and began their march to the place of burial. The husband walked at the head of the company, and followed the corpse. They proceeded to a high mountain, and when they reached the place of their destination, 
they took up a large stone which covered the mouth of a deep pit and let down the corpse with all its apparel and jewels then the husband embracing his kindred and friends suffered himself to be put into another open coffin without resistance with a pot of water and several small loaves and was let down in the same manner the mountain was of considerable length and extended along the seashore and the pit was very deep the ceremony being over the aperture was again covered with the stone and the company returned it is needless for me to tell you that i was a most melancholy spectator at this funeral while the rest was scarcely moved the custom was to them so familiar i could not forbear communication to the king my sentiment respecting the practice sir i said i cannot but feel astonished at the strange usage observed in this country of burying the living with the dead i have been a great traveller and seen many countries but never heard of so cruel a law what do you mean sinbad replied the king it is a common law i shall be interred with the queen my wife if she die first but sir said i may i presume to ask your majesty if strangers be obliged to observe this law without doubt returned the king smiling at the occasion of my question they are not exempted if they be married in this island i returned home much depressed by this answer for the fear of my wife's dying first and that i should be interred alive with her occasioned me very uneasy reflections but there was no remedy I must have patience and submit to the will of God. I trembled, however, at every little indisposition of my wife. Alas, in a little time my fears were realized, for she fell sick and died. Judge of my sorrow to be interred alive seemed to me as deplorable as termination of life as to be devoured by cannibals. It was necessary, however, to submit. The king and all his court expressed their wish to honour the funeral with their presence, and the most considerable people of the city did the same. When all was ready for the ceremony, the corpse was put into a coffin with all her jewels and her most magnificent apparel. The procession began, and, as second actor in this doleful tragedy, I went next to the corpse, with my eyes full of tears, bewailing my deplorable fate. Before we reached the mountain, I made an attempt to affect the minds of the spectators. I addressed myself to the king first, and then to all those that were around me. Bowed before them to the earth, and kissing the border of their garments, I prayed them to have compassion upon me. Consider, said I, that I am a stranger, and ought not to be subject to this rigorous law, and that I have another wife and children in my own country. Although I spoke in the most pathetic manner, no one was moved by my address. On the contrary, they ridiculed my dread of death as cowardly, made haste to let my wife's corpse into the pit, and lowered me down the next moment in an open coffin, with full of water and seven loaves. In short, the fatal ceremony being performed, they covered over the mouth of the pit, notwithstanding my grief and piteous lamentations. As I approached the bottom, I discovered by the aid of the little light that came from above the nature of this subterranean place. It seemed an endless cavern, and might be about fifty fathom deep. I was annoyed by an insufferable stench proceeding from the multitude of bodies which I saw on the right and left. Nay, I fancied that I heard some of them sigh out their last. However, when I got down, I immediately left my coffin, and, getting at a distance from the bodies, held my nose, and lay down upon the ground, where I stayed a considerable time, bathed in tears. At last, reflecting on my melancholy case, it is true, said I, that God disposes all things according to the degrees of his providence, but, unhappy Sinbad, hast thou any but thyself to blame that thou art brought to die so strange a death? Would to God thou hast perished in some of those tempests which thou hast escaped? Then thy death had not been so lingering and so terrible in all its circumstances, but thou hast drawn all this upon thyself 
by thy inordinate avarice. Ah, unfortunate wretch! Shouldst thou not rather have remained at home and quietly enjoyed the fruits of thy labour? Such were the vain compliments with which I filled the cave, beating my head and breast out of rage and despair, and abandoning myself to the most afflicting thoughts. Nevertheless, I must tell you that instead of calling death to my assistance in that miserable condition, I felt still an inclination to live, and to do all I could to prolong my days. I went groping about with my nose stopped, for the bread and water that was in my coffin, and took some of it, though the darkness of the cave was so great that I could not distinguish day and night. Yet I always found my coffin again and the cave seemed to be more spacious and fuller of bodies than it had appeared to be at first. I lived for some days upon my bread and water, which being all spent, I at last prepared for death. As I was thinking of death, I heard the stone lifted up from the mouth of the cave, and immediately the corpse of a man was let down. When reduced to necessity, it is natural to come to extreme resolutions— while they let down the woman, I approached the place where her coffin was to be put, and as soon as I perceived they were again covering the mouth of the cave, gave the unfortunate wretch two or three violent blows over the head with a large bone, which stunned, or, to say the truth, killed her. I committed this inhuman action merely for the sake of the bread and water that was in her coffin, and thus I had provision for some days more. When that was spent— they let down another dead woman, and a living man. I killed the man in the same manner, and, as there was then a sort of mortality in the town, by continuing this practice, I did not want for provisions. One day, after I had dispatched another woman, I heard something tread and breathing and panting as it walked. I advanced towards that side from whence I heard the noise, and on my approach the creature puffed and blew harder as if running away from me. I followed the noise, and the thing seemed to stop sometimes, but always fled and blew as I approached. I pursued it for a considerable time, till at last I perceived a light resembling a star. I went on, sometimes lost sight of it, but always found it again, and at last discovered that it came through a hole in the rock, large enough to admit a man. Upon this I stopped some time to rest, being much fatigued with the rapidity of my progress. Afterwards, coming up to the hole, I got through and found myself upon the seashore. I leave you to guess the excess of my joy. It was such that I could scarcely persuade myself that the hole was not a dream. But when I was recovered from my surprise, and convinced of the reality of my escape, I perceived that I had followed to be a creature which came out of the sea, and was accustomed to enter the cavern to feed upon the bodies of the dead. I examined the mountain, and found it to be situated betwixt the sea and the town, but without any passage to or communication with the latter, the rocks on the seaside being high and perpendicularly steep, I prostrated myself on the shore to thank God for this mercy, and afterwards entered the cave again to fetch bread and water, which I ate by daylight with a better appetite than I had done since my intermit. I returned thither a second time, and groped among the coffins for all the diamonds, rubies, pearls, gold bracelets, and rich stuffs I could find. These I brought to the shore, and tying them up neatly into bales, with the cords that let down the coffins, I laid them together upon the beach, waiting till some ship might appear, without fear of rain, for it was then the dry season. After two or three days, I perceived a ship just come out of the harbour, making for the place where I was. I made a sign with the linen of my turban, and called to the crew as loud as I could. They heard me, and sent a boat to bring me on board. When they asked by what misfortune I came thither, I told them that I had suffered shipwreck two days before, and made shift to get ashore with the goods they saw. It was fortunate for me that these people did not consider the place where I was, nor inquire into the probability of what I told them, but without hesitation took me on board with my goods. 
When I came to the ship, the captain was so well pleased to have saved me, and so much taken up with his own affairs, that he also took the story of my pretended shipwreck upon trust, and generously refused some jewels which I offered him. We passed by several islands, and among others that called the Isle of Bells, about ten days south from Serendib, with a regular wind, and six from that of Kila, where we landed. This island produces lead mines, Indian canes, and excellent camphire. The king of the Isle of Kila is very rich and powerful, and the Isle of Bells, which is about two days' journey in extent, is also subject to him. The inhabitants are so barbarous that they still eat human flesh. After we had finished our traffic in that island, we put to sea again, and touched at several other ports. At last I arrived happily at Baghdad, with infinite riches, of which it is needless to trouble you with the detail. Out of gratitude to God for his mercies, I contributed liberally towards the support of several mosques, and the subsistence of the poor, gave myself up to the society of my kindred and friends, enjoying myself with them in festivities and amusements. Here Sinbad finished the relation of his fourth voyage, which appeared more surprising to the company than the three former. He made a new present of one hundred sequins to Hindbad, whom he requested to return with the rest next day at the same hour to dine with him, and hear the story of his fifth voyage. Hindbad and the other guests took their leave and retired. Next morning, when they all met, they sat down at table, and when dinner was over, Sinbad began the relation of his fifth voyage as follows. End of section 23